The subject this morning is preventing progression of kidney disease, and I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Stephen Zaydem. Fadum. Uh, Dr. Fadum is a practicing nephrologist from Houston, Texas. He serves as a diplomat of the American Board of Quality Assurance and Utilization Review Physicians and a member of the American Society of Nephrology, International Society of Nephrology, Renal Physicians Association, and National Kidney Foundation. Dr. Fadum is a member of the AAKP Board of Directors and a co-medical director of the AAKP Medical Advisory Committee. Please welcome Dr. Fadum. Thank you very much and good morning. If this is too loud, let me know. Um, I want to welcome you to this session today. This is basically um, uh, designed to give you uh, a little bit more depth so that you will understand why the things that we're going to talk about are important. It's not just a, a laundry list, but I want you to understand that there's been some research, there have been some studies, and uh, I'm going to go over the studies. I'm not going to go into detail on the studies. I'll just sort of show you them. Uh, if you want to get into more depth on this, it's, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, but I, I think you'll uh, enjoy this approach. The, the name of the talk really is Preventing Kidney Disease. And uh, I, I, I'm very conflicted. I uh, consult for several large in industrial companies that um, are out there uh, perhaps exhibiting. Um, I have research projects with several of them. And I've also ventured in uh, medical direct, and I'm a medical director of a dialysis uh, uh, group. And uh, I even have stock in, in a product that's uh, that's very popular. Um, okay, first of all, the definition of chronic kidney disease. Um, most of you probably know this, but uh, chronic kidney disease is defined as either kidney damage or a GFR less than 60 cc's per minute for greater than three months. So if you got dehydrated one day or you took Motrin or something and you went to your doctor the next day and you had an abnormal GFR, the doctor wouldn't just say, okay, you know, you have chronic kidney disease. He would want to, or she would want to repeat that three months later. And uh, that's very important because there, there's a type of kidney disease called acute kidney disease as well, or acute kidney injury, or even interstitial nephritis. We can get into some really fancy words here. But the bottom line is, is that chronic kidney disease means just that, chronic kidney disease. And kidney damage, which can also be present even when the glomerular filtration rate or how the kidneys work, is not that low, can be seen by either uh, a simple urinalysis where we have protein in the urine or we can do it by an ultrasound. And those really uh, are uh, representative of two eras in healthcare. In, 19, in 1827, a fellow in Britain called Richard Bright uh, was able to notice that people who had edema or dropsy had albumin in the urine and they had um, and this was the first definition, really, of, of kidney disease. And since that time, we've advanced quite a bit in our understanding of this. And the ultrasound has really given us a very, very good tool to simply look at the kidneys and see what is going on. So these are very two uh, simple markers that are readily available. We do ultrasounds in our office. It's very readily available and uh, things that can give you some tremendous information about your kidneys. If you have kidney disease, you're not alone. You're in good company, in fact. Uh, one out of nine people in this country have kidney disease of some sort or another. I even managed to get it. Um, and uh, so you're not, you're not all by yourself. You have a lot of people that you can turn to and, and talk to and, uh, and get information from. There's, there's not a lack of information about kidney disease. It's not exactly a secret. And uh, it's very, very prevalent. This is a, a, a study, that, a slide that uh, is an old NKF slide that was based on the Haynes data. This is a national survey. And here you can see there's a lot of kidney patients between stages one and three, but it drops off precipitously. 
And uh, that's the focus of this talk. It's not so much preventing kidney disease, because if you have kidney disease, you, you, you have it. You're not going to prevent something that you already have. It's really preventing its progression and preventing its complications. Because if you have kidney disease, you don't want to have the complications of its sister heart disease. So our talk is really a little bit different than just preventing kidney disease. Uh, preventing kidney disease may mean choosing your parents, and you're not going to be able to do that. So <laughs> you may not be able to prevent kidney disease, but what you might be able to do is prevent it getting worse or presenting some, uh, preventing some of its complications. And in, in medicine, we like to use the term comorbidities. Uh, that's a big word. Nobody understands it, so we get away with it. And uh, so you, these are the things that you want to prevent. Now, the incidence rate of kidney disease has been rising, but lately it started leveling off. And this, when I say incidence rate of ESRD population, these are the people that present to the dialysis unit, or if we're lucky, to a transplant unit. And the incidence of these patients has been leveling off uh, probably because of some of the, the real heroes in, in our field uh, several years ago uh, doing research to show there are certain drugs that can prevent the disease from progressing if you use those drugs and use them wisely. And the drugs, if you want to write down two things that will help you with kidney disease, ACEs and ARBs. And ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers are converting enzyme inhibitors. Those are the fancy names for them. These are two drugs that probably when your doctor found out you had kidney disease and you had high blood pressure, they were probably the first two things, one of those two drugs your doctor put you on. Originally, we thought we could put people on both of them, but we decided not to do that. The guy in China that did that research admitted that he faked a lot of it, and uh, so we're finding ACEs and ARBs together are not a good combination. You get to be on one or the other, and uh, so uh, which one you choose depends on many factors, probably beyond the scope of this discussion, but definitely worthy of a lecture and definitely something that your doctor has heard lots of lectures on, and uh, so you can talk to him about whether you should be on an ACE or an ARB. And if you say, <coughs> doctor, what should I be on? He may not put you on an ACE, because <laughs> one of the big things it does is causes a cough. And uh, so anyway, the, if you look at the distribution of kidney disease among the population, and you take two populations here, one is the general population, and the other is the Medicare population. And if you look at it among the general population, it's much lower than it is among those of us that get discounts when we go to the movies because we're members of AARP. And uh, so the point is, is that the disease rises with age. And, uh, and this is true not just with regular kidney patients, but patients who have diabetes. The disease gets worse as we get older. And this is from the United States Renal Data Systems. This was a group that was developed uh, years ago. Uh, a guy named Phil Held was the first guy to get the contract. The, the guy in charge of it um, is a person we all know at the National Institute of Health, Paul Eggers. And it was developed many, many years ago, and it basically tracks everybody who has kidney disease. So we can look at our uh, population of kidney patients, and we can tell a lot of information, and we can use that data to move, uh, to really make decisions about health care. And uh, even though it's observational data and it doesn't uh, go through the rigorous randomized controlled trial that uh, we sometimes demand, but it's, it's very, very valuable to have this kind of uh, overview of what's going on. And you can see the incidence of kidney disease, although it's leveling off in diabetics, is still increasing as we age. And, uh, and so if you look at the different bars here, the the dotted line is the people that are 75 years old. The, um, the 65 to 74 year olds are, are in the solid blue line. And then the uh, younger population, the 20 to 44 year olds, are way down there at the bottom. So this is a disease of those of us who um, are enjoying our grandchildren. And that's probably the most politically correct way of saying that. Uh, what about staging? How do we stage patients with kidney disease? Well, I had a medical student. Uh, he thought it was smart, 
And I said, what are the five stages of kidney disease? And he said, stage one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> and uh, so he, uh, he, uh, he didn't do as well as he thought he was going to do. But uh, basically, stages one and two are the stages that you can uh, usually have a very good opportunity to protect the kidneys if you pick people up in those very, very early stages. This is something our primary care colleagues do. Uh, and this is why it's very, very important that the nephrologists, the primary care doctors have an excellent working relationship. This is probably the most important take home message here is that if you have kidney disease and you have uh, family members, you have friends and you have primary care doctors, go back and pat them on the back and tell them how important they are. Because uh, when they pick up kidney disease really, really early and they start you on a, a diet, and they tell you to stay away from processed foods, and they tell you to stay away from salt, and they tell you that Motrin is your nephrologist best friend. I mean, you know, uh, Motrin means Lexus. Motrin means Mercedes. It's, it's, if, if people quit using drugs like uh, Motrin and ibuprofen and some of these drugs, I may have to go out and get myself a real job. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's, even though it's job security, it is bad for you. And uh, long-term use of these drugs is very, very dangerous. Uh, stay away from processed foods. The only pur purpose of processed foods is so that people can truck those foods across the country and save money because processing kills insects, it kills bacteria, and it also, when it gets in your body, it kills you, but it keeps it on the shelf longer. So the grocer doesn't have to spend as much money. He doesn't have to throw out the rotted rotten food and then gets more. He can keep it on the shelf longer. So it's an economic decision, but it's not a health decision. When I go to Provence and all these really cool places in France, uh, they don't have processed food. They have a market. So you get up in the morning, you go out there, and all their food is right there for you. And, uh, and then we wonder why Provence has better outcomes than we do. It's because they don't eat all the junk food that we eat. And uh, my daddy, who uh, grew up in Jonesboro, Arkansas, you know, he, he lived to be 90 years old, exercised every day. And uh, we would go to McDonald's, and he would sit in the car. And uh, I'd say, Daddy, how come you're not going into McDonald's? He's, oh, that's heart attack food. <laughs> and uh, so th that's sort of the point. And uh, that's another very important take-home message. So uh, anyway, when you get to stage three, you start to have changes in your kidneys. And... Uh, these changes are very subtle. You may not notice them. I may not notice them. And unless you're sitting next to one of the professors that did the research at a meeting, uh, he shows you the data that he's about to publish, nobody notices them. But one day I was sitting next to Bill Mitch, who was one of my real heroes. He's the guy that really worked uh, a lot with the low-protein diet. And he's sort of the, our leader. He, he does in, in our city what Dr. Shaw does here in Arkansas. And uh, so I was sitting next to Bill, and he showed me all this data. He said, Steve, can you believe this? And I said, no, what? And uh, because we, we go to conferences every Wednesday together, he says, look at this data. He said, people, stage three are already starting to get, you know, signs and symptoms of metabolic acidosis. Look at all this data on this. And uh, I said, that's, that's awesome. He said, do you realize what this means? He said, metabolic acidosis is causing so many problems for patients. And it's causing muscle wasting, and uh, it's causing them not to create a, a synthesis of their proteins. It's causing them to go into what we call negative metabolic balance. balance. They start breaking down their muscles. And uh, if you hang around Bill Mitch too long, you'll know why. You'll have more information than you really want to know about. But I can tell you it's not pretty. And so uh, knowing about metabolic acidosis is very, very important. Anemia, metabolic acidosis, and bone disease start in stage three because some of the adaptive mechanisms that we try to compensate for our lack of kid loss of loss of kidneys with is actually damaging our bodies. Some of these growth factors that are trying to get rid of all that extra phosphorus that we eat in our diets they're they're bad for us, and so that's something that is really important. So stage three patients have a tremendous opportunity. They can go either way, usually. They can stay in stage three and live a very nice life, be very, very healthy, or they can do what uh, a lot of people do, is they can just basically um, 
not have the fortune to see a doctor or if they do see a, a good doctor, not listen to the doctor and they can continue living the lifestyle they're living and then they can come on over to the dialysis unit and, you know, I mean, we have multi-billion dollar national companies that will be very, very happy to see you. But um, I shouldn't have said that if we're being recorded and, and I actually work with some of these companies, but they're, they're great companies and they do a great job. But no offense to them, I'd rather you not go see them. I'd rather them turn the dialysis units into ballrooms and dancing studios and let's let you guys stay healthy and uh, they'll figure out another way to make money. Uh, so um, the bottom line we have here, though, is that we have to really uh, do a good job with patient care. This is a giant group out of Ka uh, called Kaiser, and they're out of California. And they looked at their rates of kidney disease, and they found that the incidence of kidney disease, when you, it, it starts out at 69% of their patients are, are pretty good. They, they really don't have much kidney disease at all. But about 27%, uh, and this is very similar to the National Haynes Data Group, is about 31%. And then you get down into the 3 to 4%, and then you get down to 0.17%. So basically, or, or 17, I should have said 17%, um, and, or one point, no, it's, it's, it's wrong. It's actually 0.17. It is correct. You get down to 0.17%. Very, very few people, when you look at the total population, ever reach kidney disease uh, to the extent that they'll need dialysis in that group. And they have a very proactive program to try to prevent it, too. And um, anyway, uh, the, the calculator that's used to figure out how we stage patients comes from the modification of diet and renal disease protocols that were developed years ago to see if a low-protein diet would work. And uh, the low-protein diet sort of does work. It, it was very difficult to interpret that data. Uh, it may not have worked as well uh, for many, many reasons, but um, we still use a low-protein diet in, in our patients uh, in many instances and have very, very good success with that. One of the things that's very interesting is that this variable that we use, age, race, gender, and creatinine, all these numbers can be plugged into a computer, and you can instantly know what's going on. And this is on the Internet. It's free, and you can use this anytime you want. This is the calculator that's been adopted by the National Kidney Foundation. So this is actually the National Kidney Foundation's calculator. And uh, what they did was they nested my calculator, and this is my calculator, and it's mdrd.com. So you can either go to the National Kidney Foundation site or to mdrd.com, and you can always know what your kidney function is. And um, so anyway, when we think about kidney disease, we think about risks. So what are the risks that we're taking when we uh, acquire kidney disease or when, we're, when we have it? First of all is our glomerular filtration rate and our cardiovascular disease prognosis are intertwined. If you have an abnormal GFR, you are going to have a higher risk of doing poorly with your heart. It's going to cause heart disease. And that, that's a blunt, hard to accept fact of life that you have to understand that you are at higher risk to have a heart attack if you have kidney disease. So you have to do things that maybe other people don't want to do or don't have to do. You have to be very, very careful with your diet, with your weight, with your cigarettes which you shouldn't be smoking, <clears throat> with your serum bicarbonate level, which is probably the least uh, expensive way to help to control your kidneys, uh, keeping your protein and your urine down by using the medicine that your doctor has given you, keeping your blood pressure under control and uh, making sure that it's, uh, it's not high, and also avoiding acute kidney injury, which means staying hydrated when you go to get a test done. Don't let anybody give you uh, something that you're not sure of. Uh, be very, very careful um, to, uh, to avoid the non anti-inflammatory agents. And be very, very careful of a two-hit process. What happens is sometimes people get chemotherapy, and chemotherapy causes a little bit of damage to the kidneys, and they would do fine. They would never have a problem. 
but they have a decreased reserve and they have little particles that are left inside the kidneys, little residual damage areas. And what happens is the kidney remembers when something else happens. So that person who was on chemotherapy gets well and he goes and takes a bunch of a leave. And the next thing you know, he goes to his doctor with a creatinine level of four. And uh, I heard about that the hard way because uh, I became uh, friendly with, with one of the doctors that was taking care of me when I was at MD Anderson. And uh, he was an oncologist, and he, th he and his colleagues did two things. Number one, they started sending me all of the other patients in the clinic who had kidney failure. And so here I'd be sitting next to somebody, and the next day I'd be seeing them in the office as a patient. So I said, I'm not going to do what they did. The second thing they made me do was write a chapter on it. And uh, so I ended up writing a book chapter on kidney failure, secondary to, to chemotherapy. And I, I don't know if anybody ever read the chapter. It went in a book that nobody reads, you know, all these cancer books. But the thing of it was I learned a lot writing that chapter. And one of the things I learned was I don't want another hit. Uh, and that's the thing you all need to be aware of. You may have had a hit, you may have had a surgery, you may have had, it might have happened with pregnancy, it could have happened with, um, uh, you know, some, an accident, trauma, whatever happened, you don't want it, you don't want a second hit, so then you have to be more careful. The, the secret to keeping away from the dialysis machine is to be vigilant and be very, very careful. So the questions we ask, what's going to cause my kidneys to get worse and what can I do now? Is there some simple formula that will help me know if my kidneys are going to progress and what factors are going to prepare me for renal replacement therapy should that day arrive that I may need to go to one of these dialysis units? Um, so the question is, what causes my kidneys to get worse and what can I do now? And uh, first of all, people talk about heart and soul. Well, you know, here we – Years ago, the, some of the old-time people noticed that when people got drunk with some of the spirits, this was thousands of years ago, they acted a little bit nutty, and they also made a lot of urine. So they used to think that the, the, the seat of the soul was the kidney. And uh, some people think differently now, but, you know, there are still uh, those among us that think the, the kidney has soul. And... Um, so, but we talk about heart and kidney, and uh, these two are totally combined with one another. And uh, so the glomerular filtration rate, the number we use, this was a number that was, they, they looked at several thousand patients. This was a study that was published a few years back in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they looked at several thousand patients who had heart attacks. And then they, they had the serum creatinine level from them, so they went through and they estimated the glomerular filtration rate, and they came out and said for every 10-unit drop in how that kidney filters, the hazard of having a heart attack goes up 10%. That means 10% is 10%. Your kidney function drops 10%. You have a 10% more risk of having a heart attack. And here's the data if you want to look at that. Um, and uh, I downloaded this directly from the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, they have uh, they had the slides uh, free. Evidently, they really want you to, to see this. And um, the um, the they, another study. Uh, this is uh, more data on that. They actually looked at the glomerular filtration rates of over a million patients. They, this is another study they did over a four year period. These were people that were not on dialysis, and they had nothing. They were just kidney disease patients, and uh, they followed them for 2.8 uh, years. And the age uh, was, you know, uh, pretty equal. They were in their 50s. And you can see what happens is the filtration rate goes down. As your kidneys get worse, your risk of having a, a problem goes up. So the risk of death goes up with kidney disease. And this is very, very important to know because if you don't know this, and then you go and you eat the same foods that, that people that don't have kidney disease eat, you're going to have a worse outcome. So, but if you know it and you prevent by doing or proactive, then you'll improve. So when, when the guys that want to do this study maybe, you know, in 10 years, the people that have really listened to this data, that they won't have an increased incidence of kidney disease. So this is something that we might be able to, to work on. 
Now this is a study that was done after the trial was finished. It's called a post hoc analysis. And it was done on a heart outcomes and prevention evaluation trial, what was called the HOPE trial. And here they looked at almost 1,000 patients who had kidney disease. Uh, and then they looked at about 8,000 patients who didn't have kidney disease. And they compared the risk. And you can imagine what the risk was, was that chronic kidney disease increased the risk for heart disease. And uh, the risk was about 40%. Uh, the hazard ratio, was what they call it, was about 40%. And so uh, this is another study which shows the same thing. I'm not going to go into the details of this data. So what's the take-home message here? Preventing heart disease and kidney disease, hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis, hypertension, vascular calcification, what you get from the processed foods, and left ventricular hypertrophy. That's a big word that means your left ventricle of your heart, the main pumping station in the heart, is hypertrophy. That means it's big, like your muscles. You lift weights, you get muscle hypertrophy, and you know, like Arnold. And but what you want to do is you don't want that to happen to your heart. And if you eat enough salt, the salt causes, especially if you have kidney disease, the salt retains the water, and the water puts pressure. So it's sort of like if you have a motorboat and take that motorboat engine out of the water, you can see how fast it goes. You put that motorboat engine in the water and it goes a lot slower. And uh, so that's why uh, you, you don't want your motorboat to run underwater. You, you basically want your motor to be above uh, as, with as little water <laughs> as possible. And that's why you don't want to eat salt. And if you don't want to eat salt, then that's, that's something that is a real challenge because salt is everywhere. And uh, so there are a lot of hidden culprits that are causing us uh, damage, and they're the food additives. Uh, one of them is, uh, is very, very common. It's uh, phosphoric acid. And phosphoric acid gives a nice bite to, to, to drinks. So they put it in Coca-Cola, and it makes it taste kind of, gives it a nice bite to it. And it gives it a nice kind of flavor, but uh, it also is very, very damaging to the body. And we're going to go over that because um, how, how am I doing with time? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 18, minutes. 18 minutes. Oh, I'm in great shape. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, phosphorus is very, very dangerous. And, and I'll just tell you, the veterans hospitals around the country did a study, and they were able to document that people with kidney disease have – uh, a higher phosphorus. Phosphorus is associated with kidney disease. And if you look, look at, at phosphorus levels, and then they looked at it in the normal population. They didn't look at it in people with kidney disease, and they just basically noticed that kidney disease was associated, not that phosphorus was associated with heart disease in the general population. And uh, in the dialysis population, Phosphorus is associated with death. If you have a high phosphorus, you're not going to do well. You're going to have a worse outcome. That's true in kidney disease as well. So uh, serum phosphorus is associated with death. No matter how you look at this, this is a study from Dr. Tonelli, who's uh, done a, a really nice job with this. And uh, so basically the reason we have this problem is processed foods. Now, we used to be hunters and gatherers. We used to go and we would kill a saber-toothed tiger and, or kill a, kill a buffalo or something, and then we would eat it, and then we would <clears throat> do something else. But then we decided to develop agriculture, and we decided to share food. And then what happened was some bright people said, okay, my food is going bad. Let me figure out how I can preserve it. And uh, one of the guys that did that was a guy named James Lewis Kraft. And he was in Chicago, and he, the interesting story, how he, he ran out of money, and all he had was his horse, and he sold his horse, and he figured out how he could process cheese so that it would last longer, and the rest is history. And uh, our historic events uh, go back to um, a lot of things that, that happened in, through the years. Um, one of the most exciting, I guess, was, uh, of course, McDonald's started really in 1940. 1937, very historic moment in history was the development of Spam. So, <clears throat> so we have done a lot now. 1968 was the Big Mac. 
1984 was a, a, a very, we're, we're going to celebrate this as a holiday, the development of Ben and Jerry's. So, uh, and then in 1995, so we could preserve foods even better, the food industry came up with liquid sodium phosphate. So, um, and don't forget, it kills insects, it kills bacteria. It's wonderful for preserving food. <clears throat> Anthropologists can come back uh, 500 years from now and they won't starve. But the problem is it, it also kills you. I mean, it's in everything. I mean, you go out, you know, uh, my son-in-law went out, and, I mean, he shot a deer, and he was so proud of himself, and we made it into pork, uh, and, and it, it made it into deer sausage. And um, so uh, what happened was when uh, we looked at the ingredients, it had phosphorus in it. And this was pork sausage that, um, that somebody else had, and, and it had phosphorus in it. So, I mean, some of this food you eat, if, if you're going to eat it, I mean, look at the ingredients at least because you don't think it has so, uh, phosphorus in it, and it does. I mean, who would expect that deer sausage would have phosphorus in it? But sure enough, it does. And um, I don't, uh, I try to stay away from certain foods because I know they have a lot of salt in them, and, you know, and, and that would be, you got to be careful when you eat stuff like this. And this is the reason why. Plants have a lot of phosphorus in them, but it's all bound up, so you don't digest it very well, unless you're an antelope or, you know, Bambi or something. Uh, uh, meat has a lot of phosphorus in it, but it's good for you. So, I mean, you gotta, you got to eat. If you're going to eat meat, you know, then uh, you, you're going to get phosphorus, but, but at least it's good for you. Milk varies because it's got phosphorus in it, but it's bound up, with a, and you need certain enzymes to digest it. So it's relatively safe. The problem in, in uh, grains, it's very low bioavailability. But processed foods, terrible. I mean, they're, they'll, they'll come right into your body. We haven't figured out a way to, to metabolize phosphorus. So you eat it in Coca-Cola, drink it, and, or in, uh, you know, some of these foods, uh, processed potato chips and stuff. It just goes right into your body, and that's that. And it basically goes right here, right in the middle of your blood vessels in this area right here. And what it does is it causes it to get very hard and damaged. So when your heart pumps against it, your heart's having to, you know, lift weights. And, you know, so hearts don't, shouldn't have to lift weights because they work 24-7. But what you do is you put extra strain on your heart. And you don't have the capillaries, the little tiny blood vessels in your heart. So what happens is these blood vessels that you do have, uh, they don't serve the heart well. And you end up getting scar tissue in the heart. And this causes sudden death. It causes um, shortness of breath. It makes you sick. <coughs> so that's what we want to do. We don't want this to happen. And um, how it does happen is the muscles uh, in the heart, actually, when the phosphorus comes into them, it causes genes to cause a reaction. And I mean, this is really, really complicated. This guy gave me an article to read about it. And it's, it's way, I mean, it's almost... It's, it's sort of a top level of understanding. You have to read stuff like this with a genetics dictionary to really understand it at certain levels. But the bottom line is it causes a cell that's supposed to be a muscle cell to turn into a bone cell. And uh, that's what happens. And that bone cell is just like bone. It's just like a seashell. And uh, that's not what you want. It happens naturally as your kidney disease progresses unless you modify your diet. Uh, Vitamin D, very important to you. And uh, it's very important because your kidneys don't make as much vitamin D. And even though there's uh, certain activation products for it, if you have, you, you still don't want to have regular vitamin D deficiency because then your muscles get weak and, um, and your bones uh, can't remodel and some of the calcium from your bones can come into your system. Now, here's another situation. This guy gave me a really dirty look when I snapped his picture. Luckily, this was down in South America, and I don't think he's got the Internet because I don't think he'd want me to show him. He was sitting here munching on this ice cream cone, with, and he didn't need to eat it. And, uh, but the bottom line is, is that obesity is associated with a lot of problems. And uh, when you do the research on it and you look at people who have kidney disease and you look at their body mass index and then you look at their families, it's related to kidney disease. And, of course, there's what we call the odds ratio of that. So, you know, sort of like if you're shooting craps or something, we talk about odds. And 
same, same thing. In fact, uh, some of the research that was done was developed by, they call it Monte Carlo, and I've got 10 minutes left. And uh, so I'm not going to talk about Monte Carlo, but the bottom line is, is that you, if you're overweight, you are at risk to develop kidney disease. It's a very powerful predictor. We're programmed to overeat. This is a sugar cane factory from Hawaii, and it's now a museum. It's closed down because we've gone to fructose, sugar, corn syrup. And the corn syrup that we use is very, very damaging to the body because we're not, intend we're not supposed to eat it. And uh, we basically short circuit our system. If you're um, a baboon in Africa, you, you know, some baboons stay out and, and you know, and, and they just don't come in. They stay way out there, and you got to see them when you're in your little rover running around. Some of them come right into the camp, and they just hang around the kitchen. And when they did a study, they found the ones that hang around the kitchen have high insulin and high cholesterol levels. And, uh, but the ones that stuck to their natural diets of shrubs, berries, and small animals did fine. So, uh, you know, it's, it's not just us. I mean, our GI tracts are not designed to eat the food that, you know, that, jo that uh, Mr. Kraft uh, figured out we should be eating. Uh, so we're now starting to look like another animal, and that's not good. <laughs> One more thing I, I really want to stress, a couple more things that before I get to questions and answers, is everything is cool about this picture. I mean, look at that red Mustang in the background. Uh, this is in Paris, and there's the Arts de Triomphe. This is the hot part of the city. Everybody's cool. And here's this girl, I mean, Louis Vuitton, Gucci. Uh, she's probably a model. But look at her. She's sitting there, and there's one thing that's not cool about her, and that's that stupid piece of paper with tobacco in it hanging out of her mouth. I don't know why this girl's doing that, but it's just not cool. But it's also not good for you because if you look at a prospective 20-year community and you look at 23,000 people, uh, they had a higher risk of getting kidney disease and of getting heart attacks, and everybody knows about heart attacks, and, but kidney disease, I mean, you know, uh, women, 2.9, men, 2.3, these were the hazards. This was your hazard of getting kidney disease. It was over almost three times as much for, for this pretty girl right here, and it would have been two and a half times as much as the guy in the Mustang that was kind of <laughs> keeping his eye on her, too. And uh, I had my wife with me, and, and I was... And she got mad that I took the picture. So, but nevertheless, uh, the, the story is that you do not want to smoke, and you don't want your children, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, or anyone to smoke. It's just really, really bad. And no matter what you do, bicarbonate. There are pills you can take. You can buy really cheaply that can help protect your kidneys. And they've been doing research on this. Acid in your body is really bad for you, and uh, of course this is, um, you know, a lot of stuff that, that Dr. Mitch has, has, has done that dates back even to the 1990s that uh, it basically interferes with, with, uh, with albumin synthesis, it, it changes your metabolism, maybe a little, uh, a little bicarb tablet, you know, two or three times a day may help protect your kidneys. I put my patients on it, and they seem to do very well with protection. Protein in the urine, this is something that um, the bottom line is, is that uh, it is bad. It causes uh, uh, an incidence, uh, even a small amount of albumin in the urine is an indicator for cardiovascular disease. And it's a very powerful determinant of renal deterioration. This is the study that Bepi Ramuzzi did years ago. It's from the RAIN trial. And it just basically shows you got protein in your urine. The more protein, the worse you're going to be. And uh, then uh, a guy named Gil Machio published years ago, and of course Edmund Lewis and the collaborative study group also has published that if you're on an ACE inhibitor or you're on an ARB or something like that, uh, you're going to uh, do really, really well um, and compared to people that aren't. Blood pressure, I, I don't need to say anything about blood pressure. This group knows. You've got to keep your blood pressure under control. And whatever it takes, this is the number to remember. Uh, this is the five-minute talk on blood pressure. Adaptation. We were meant to walk upright. We were not meant to drive. We did that later on. We were meant to burn calories. 
we were meant to not eat as much as we do, and when we are maladaptive, then we end up getting into uh, trouble, and that's exactly what we're doing. And uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, I mentioned. Blood pressure, you know about that. Blood pressure is bad. That's all I need to say. Keep your blood pressure 130 over 80 or below. Uh, blood pressure causes pressure. That's why I call it blood pressure, pressure in the system. It's just like, just think of your blood vessels like you think of the garden hose. And um, all cells will form calluses, just like your fingers will. And blood pressure will cause that. Acute kidney injury we talked about in the beginning. Uh, you don't want to have acute kidney injury, but if you do, you have to be extra careful. And the bottom line is there's an overlap between the risk factors and an overlap between what you can do to prevent the risk factors. There's a simple formula that was developed by Kaiser where you just take half of the age, add it to the GFR. If it's greater than 85, you're at low risk. If it's less than 85, you need to work on getting it at low risk. But, uh, and this is a simple calculator that people can use. There's a limit to people that can benefit from dialysis. I don't have time to go through the Carlson Index or the surprise question or any of these other things or the Karnofsky score. Th these could be things we could talk about at another time. Uh, the bottom line is, though, that um, you want to be healthy. And to skip to the, the, the last slide, if you do need dialysis, uh, obviously get a fistula in early, look at the different modalities, lose weight, think about peritoneal dialysis uh, as well, um, get your fistula or get your PD catheter in as soon as you can, get prepared for that. And um, so um, I'll go ahead and um, end here uh, with a simple formula. Risk reduction equals prevention. And you want to reduce the risk. You want to prevent the disease. And uh, this is kind of a reminder of what, what I talked about. So I'll leave it open to questions. Thank you very much. OK, yes. That's a tough question to be able to answer. I don't know. Um, you know, some people think you can. There's been some studies done with Renvella uh, that show that you can reverse it, but it's very, very difficult to do that. It's uh, and there's some studies, obviously, that I can't talk about that um, that are being done right here that may be able to show that happening someday. But nevertheless, uh, you know, for the for practical reasons, I would say try not to get the heart into the arteries. So, uh, question, yes. I have stage three chronic disease, and my doctor said that aside from eating a heart healthy diet, I didn't need to make any other adjustments to my diet. Okay. Well, I, I probably don't know your doctor because if I did, he probably wouldn't have told you that. He probably told you more stuff than that. There's a lot you need to do. You need to stay away from uh, phosphorus, you need to stay away from uh, extra salt, you need to stay from protein. Th this is something that needs to be emphasized because stage three patients have the greatest opportunity to stay at stage three and not move forward and you really want to keep your blood pressure under control and sometimes it's not easy to do with medicines. Sometimes you have to stay away from salt. It's, it, yes, it is heart healthy too, but you know, you sort of want to focus on on the proteins a little bit more than, than the heart patients do. Yes? If you look on the screen there, you almost got phosphorus on there. Where's the red flag? Is that on there? You say, uh-oh, don't eat this. I mean, this is way you, too much phosphorus. Usually nutrients are listed in the order of the, the composition. So if, if, if phosphorus is the first ingredient, then that means it's phosphorus. If phosphorus is the last ingredient, it means it's probably just tainted with low phosphorus. Okay. It doesn't tell you the exact number, and the way to find that is to go to the USDA database. It's called foodvalues.us. It's something that we developed. Uh, uh, we took the USDA database, and we parsed it and made it understandable. It's called foodvalues.us. It'll give you the exact content of the food of everything that you eat. It'll tell you exactly how much phosphorus is in it. Any other questions? Yes? Probably not. But uh, we'll see what we can do. It's, it's a lot of information. We'll see, we'll see what we can do. Um, 
it's a lot to download, but um, I, I'd love for you to try to, uh, to maybe we'll, we'll see what we can do to get access available to people that they can download it from the AKP website. If not, keep reading Read Alive because that's uh, the magazine I edit and uh, we put stuff like this in Renal Life all the time. Uh, foodvalues.us, write that number down. You will, uh, you will love that website because you just simply take the food that you had and you just go to that website and you just look it up. It's all alphabetical. It'll tell you how much phosphorus is in it. And you don't want to eat more than a couple of grams so, uh, a day. So you just add it up, and when you hit two grams, then no more Coca-Cola. Uh, yes, there were two questions. Yes. Well, Coca-Cola is phosphoric acid. It doesn't get much higher than that. Uh, yes. Two thousand, two grams. That's a lot, man. You can kill yourself with that. I mean, knock yourself out. That's a lot of phosphorus. Eighty-two, two, and about two grams of phosphorus is what they recommend. And uh, yeah, Coca-Cola is probably the highest content of phosphorus because it's phosphoric acid. That's what it is. I mean, you know, let, let's put it this way. Uh, except, except uh, the African acacia root stuff. Root beer. Root beer doesn't have phosphorus in it. But, uh, but let me tell you. I had trouble with my flash attachment, corrosion, potassium hydroxide, or corroded my battery uh, connectors. I put Coca-Cola on it. They quit using it to clean toilets because too much phosphorus was getting into the environment. It was killing the plants and animals. And when, the, when they, these companies found out there was so much phosphorus in this stuff, they took it out of their laundry detergents because it was harming the environment. And the companies that did that needed to figure out what to do. So they made the biphosphonates, the stuff that you take for osteoporosis. Is there any way of burning that stuff off? Uh, yeah, before you eat it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if exercise will burn out phosphorus. But, um, the best way to burn it off is to, uh, to just don't buy it. Just stay out, of the, stay out of that section of the grocery store. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah.